I'm constantly uh, made thankful for the great array of talent that we have in a congregation of this size. I think now particularly of the song leaders, and we are appreciative of Ryan and his wife being here and Ryan leading singing. I especially thank him for leading number 413. I don't know that we've ever sung that here. I hadn't sung it. Maybe you have. In remembrance, I was looking at it, and I don't know whether you noticed who wrote the lyrics or who wrote the music. Brother Rue Porter died back in the 60s. Brother Will Slater. Brother Slater was one of the best songwriters that we had in the Lord's Church. And Brother Porter was one of the best preachers and debaters we had. And I labored in areas where he had done much work throughout the early part of the 20th century. Brother Slater was well known in that area. And while I was up there, got to know his brother. And uh, I don't know of finer folks than them. Now, why I say this, uh, who's going to write the songs for tomorrow? Do you have the talent and the get up and go to do it? These folks were just ordinary people, but they knew the importance of such things, and they wrote them. It's amazing how many songs we're singing still today that were written a long time ago. I don't see many people interested in doing that today. If they're around, I don't know where they are, but uh, we ought to think about that when it comes to the future. And we're so thankful to sing that song. And notice how scriptural it, it was and what it set out and the ideas it formed in your mind preparatory to observing the Lord's Supper. This time last week, uh, no one could foresee, though we had an idea there was gonna be a lot of rain, no one could foresee what would take place the next, really, day, but a couple of days in particular. People are dead now that were alive last week. Many people are terrible ordeals due to the loss of property and due to the flood. And I think of Ryan and his family having knowledge of the murder that took place and personal knowledge and how terrible that kind of thing is. And yet when you turn on your news, you see something like that all the time. And somebody knows those people personally, just like Brian's family does. But what do we expect? Is it going to get better in this world? No, this is the way the world is. But God expects us to be righteous before Him. And His church is to be holy. And His church is to be the army of the Lord. And we are soldiers in particular in living out the gospel in our lives and in opposing all manner of error. We don't live in friendly times for Christianity. In fact, more and more people militantly oppose it. They don't just passively say, oh, forget it. They want to oppose it. They want to challenge the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the inspiration of the Bible. They want to challenge anybody upholding anything, especially in moral matters about what ought to be and the way people ought to live. They do not want you to tell them you're in sin. Yet there's no way that you can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and not deal with sin. It was meant to deal with sin. It is the solution to the sin problem. Romans 3.23 makes it clear. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And chapter 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. That's separation from God. No person can leave this life separated from God and expect heaven to be his home. And the truth of Jesus Christ makes it clear as to exactly what one must believe and obey to be saved from his sins and to be a member of the church that he built and purchased with his own precious blood and to which he adds everyone that is saved by his gospel. I would guess this sermon is designed to be more of a sermon to exhort the members of the church to rise up as the army of the Lord and to fight the fight of faith 
That is, fight those things that are against the truth of Jesus Christ and uphold those things that are in harmony with it and that promote righteousness in this world. But to know as we do such that it will not be necessarily a pleasant thing as our society and our government begins to stand opposed to and even sometimes militantly opposing it and wanting to do hurt to those in some way or the other, to one extent or the other, who would advocate the righteous living that the New Testament sets out. Sometimes because we've had such a blessing and a protection since this country came into existence of the freedom of religion, we get the idea it's always been that way. Folks, it's been a whole lot more the other way than ever has been what we've known in the 230 some odd 40 years of existence of the United States. We need to understand that. When I look back in the Old Testament at the picture Isaiah gave in the words of Isaiah 53, I stand amazed at how people form a different picture of Jesus Christ than what he did by inspiration. When you look at people painting pictures of Christ, you see almost an effeminate, weak, docile person. You do not find Jesus Christ pictured that way in the Bible. No one could do what he did and resist what he resisted and oppose what he opposed and not be exceedingly strong and courageous. Listen to how he's described in Isaiah 53 as Isaiah saw him through inspiration over 700 years before Jesus walked this earth. And remember Isaiah is called the Messianic prophet. He describes him, he is despised and he is rejected. This is in verse 3. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Then look up in the verse just preceding that. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Well, yet look at how he's depicted so many times in the movies and the pictures. He didn't stand out as a human being in his appearance physically. There was nothing about him that would uh, draw you to him because of his physical appearance. He is never pictured as somebody that's giddy and silly. He's never pictured as somebody that is full of happiness the way the world defines happiness. Notice that he's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. You see then that God himself by inspiration describes Jesus as a man burdened with a job to do. And he would say things like the night cometh when no man works. And by that he was saying, while I'm here at this time, I have a stipulated period to do on this earth what I came to do, and I must work the works of him that sent me. What it is day, the night cometh when no man shall work. And I must be about my father's business, he said at 12 years old, to his own earthly parents. That's what he was here to do. And it was a matter of confronting evil. You can't read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and not see his effort in his ministry to confront that which was wrong, even among and especially among the Jews who should have been welcoming him, who should, by the law of Moses, have recognized him, for the law was the schoolmaster to bring him unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. But they didn't. They had a view that was contrary to the Scriptures. They thought he would come as some kind of David or Solomon in regal glory and establish a kingdom that would even surpass Solomon's and put the Jews in a position of power over all people and be exalted the way one kingdom would exalt itself. But that wasn't the way. And so they were blinded due to their own prejudices and viewpoints and misunderstandings of the law and establishing their own righteousness. They set aside the will of heaven and thus... They condemned the very Messiah that came to save them to death, crying, crucify him, crucify him, when a pagan would have let him grow. They wouldn't have it. And so it is that we have an example in Christ what the spiritual body of Christ ought to be doing. 
We are members in particular redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. When we were baptized into Christ, our old sins were washed away by the blood of Christ in the waters of baptism. And we were raised to walk a new life, a new outlook on life, a new concept of life, a new way of living. And we are urged throughout the New Testament in letters written to churches and to individual Christians not to conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. That that's our spiritual or reasonable service to do that. We just finished the auditorium class, Second Peter, and it's closed. it closes by saying, here's what's going to happen with this present evil world. The material, physical world will be done away. And then he makes the application. In view of that, what kind of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and conduct? In view of this whole realm going, coming to an end, everything we experience in the flesh, all going to be gone. How should you live? What should you do? How can we preach the gospel to a world caught up in sin? When there are many false gospels that says just keep on living like you want to and it's all right. God will receive you anyway. He's so full of love and grace, he won't turn anybody down. How can we as the church of the living God and members in particular do our part in our day-to-day -day walk of life in spreading the gospel to every creature and the gospel is God's power to save us, Romans 1.16. We are under obligation to preach it to every creature. How can we do that and not confront sin in the lives of the people we are around? In our own family, in the job, in the schools, in the government. We must. It's part of what we do. It's the way that we are the leavening for good in the world. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. We dare not lose our savor. When is the last time that we plan to confront evil? How many churches of our Lord are advertising, while yet we can so do it in the newspaper, challenging evil on every hand? All of this complaining and carrying on about homosexuality and transgender whatever, just old ungodly corruption. How many churches of our Lord have challenged these people publicly and said, here is where we stand and we are welcoming your ability to stand up and be counted and prove to us what you're advocating is right. And we'll meet you on the polemic platform publicly and expose it. We're not ashamed of our Lord nor his gospel nor Christian living is set out of the New Testament. But we're not doing it. All you've got to do is look at Jesus Christ and he went about every day doing good. And part of that good, most of that good, was teaching people what was right and what was wrong and showing them how they needed to come out of the wrong and embrace the right. Even declaring of himself that he is the Son of God, the Messiah, the one Isaiah spoke of. I hesitate not to say the church of our Lord is on this earth. Because people have believed and from the heart obeyed the gospel and the Lord has added them to the church. Now what are they to do? What are we to do if you're members of the church? What are we to do to make our calling and election sure if we're not to follow in the footsteps of Jesus? Peter says in, in, when it comes to suffering, he's left us an example that we should follow in his steps. Well, he's left us an example we should follow in his steps in the confrontation of evil and in being righteous examples and how to be both. And he expects it of us. And yet we sort of silently complain and mutter, but we don't get too loud about it. In Psalm 119, verse 128, the psalmist said, Therefore I esteem thy precepts concerning all things to be right. But he doesn't end there. He then says, and I hate every false way. Do you? you? You can't esteem the precepts of God to be right and not hate everything contrary to them. It's obvious that the love of God will bring about a certain kind of hate. And yet you're here today now. If you really love God and you're really a Christian, you won't hate anything. The cry of many churches today is to love God, love your fellow man, love your neighbor, love your brothers and sisters in Christ, love the devil. They have it all mixed up on the Bible doctrine of love. They don't understand it. Even when it comes to talking about the love of God, they don't realize that the true proof of your love and my love of God is to keep his commandments. 
If you really have faith, trust, and confidence in God on the basis of what His Word teaches, the only true proof of it is to keep His commandments, for faith without works is dead. And that's talking about obedient works. And the same is true of love. If you love me, Jesus said to the apostles, those on this earth that were so near and dear to him, he said, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. But are we in the church who even think we're so strong at times and so sound in the lighthouse of truth for other churches? Are we really putting into practice as far as a general collective work of the church or individually where we are, what Jesus did and what the apostles did? You ever notice wherever the apostles went, they caused confusion. Oh, the Christians don't do that. Christ goes into the temple. Twice he cleansed it, made a scourge, overturned the money changers' seats, run the animals out, declared to everybody, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. And then today, some pious nut turns around and says, I wish Jesus would be more of a Christian when he had done that. Now, that's where we are, brethren. That's a joke, I know. But that's where people are when they follow a false concept of love and grace, mercy, tenderness, and kindness to a degree it's never taught in the Bible. Never is that taught in the Bible. When you read Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians 13, and we ought to read it all the time to understand the real love of God. Have you ever noticed the component parts of love? There's a, you can, in fact, you ought to spend all your life trying to put into practice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. But he gives us some guidelines as to what is love and what is not. Now watch what he does in verse 4. We'll begin reading of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, love, charity in the King James Version, and that's just simply love in action. Love or charity suffers long and is kind. Love envieth not, love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, is not proud and vain. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil. Now look at verse 6. Rejoice is not in iniquity. Iniquity is anything contrary to the will of Christ and the way God wants things done. Doesn't rejoice in that. But rejoices in the truth. Now I want you to think about that just for a moment. Rejoices in the truth. Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, If you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. He prayed in John 17, verse 17, Father, sanctify, meaning set them apart for my service. Make them holy. Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You can say that something is an act of love, but listen, if it's contrary to the truth as it is in the word of God, it's not an act of love. You can measure everything else you want to in the component parts set out here, the great agape love that always seeks another's highest good. But the highest good of anybody is to get them to believe and know and do the truth. Rejoice is not in iniquity, but rejoice is in the truth. When people are rejoicing in things contrary to the teaching of the New Testament, to the truth and the words of the New Testament of Jesus Christ, that is not love. The truth is the measurement. It's the standard of what is right and what is wrong. And to the extent that people don't know it, then they have not a standard to measure all things correctly. And they're liable to come to the wrong conclusions. Are you righteously indignant towards sin, sin being the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. We ought to be because Jesus was, and he's our example, teaching us how to live. One time, we have this happening in the life of Christ. 
in Mark 3, the first six verses. Speaking of Jesus, and he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man with a withered hand, and they watched him. Folks, let me tell you something. The world's watching us. Our own brethren are watching us to see what we do and how we do it and when we do it because the world reads what Christianity is by the conduct of the members of the Lord's church, those who claim to be Christians. So they watched Jesus. And what they watched him for was to say, whether to see whether he would heal this man on the Sabbath day. It wasn't a matter of healing him. They wanted to see if he'd do it on Sabbath day. And they were looking for something that they might accuse him of because they were following their traditions as to the way the Jews were to conduct themselves on the Sabbath day and not the teaching of the law of Moses. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful? In other words, did Moses teach? Is it according to the law of Moses a good thing to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill. But they held their peace. <laughs> Rightly they should have for their, <laughs> they may have learned by now you don't answer his questions. You just get in bigger trouble when you answer his questions. And when he had looked, now watch here, here's the son of God who loves us who is coming to die for us. And yet look to his own people who should have recognized him and, he look, and, he, and when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. You know, you can be grieved at people's sin and still be angry with them. But you notice, as I've said so many times, and it's so true, but we don't get it. Jesus never got angry at people treating him personally in a certain way. But he got so angry at people righteously indignant because of their lack of love and mercy and their disposition toward the word of truth that caused them to violate it and still think they were acceptable to God. He looked about them with anger and gives you the reason he was grieved for the hardness of their heart. They were unteachable. They weren't going to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save their soul. They had an attitude that says if it doesn't suit us, it doesn't make any difference what's said. We're not going to receive it. But he goes ahead and said, or the scripture reveals, that he saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored whole as the other. Now notice, they didn't rejoice in that. Wouldn't we all rejoice if we had somebody here that from birth, let's say it had a withered hand, and the Lord uh, heals it. And it's just like his other good hand. Well, look at the reaction of the Pharisees. The Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. These folks are dishonest. They're not interested in doing God's will, but they want to claim that the greatest there ever was on earth in service to God. But nobody is that unless they humbly are rendering obedience to God's will. I am righteously indignant, but I'm not sinfully angry. I get that way quite a bit. I want to follow my Lord, so I have no choice but to train my mind to get upset at people who will not obey God's will. Now, what's wrong with folks when they can see people regularly violating the truth of God, still thinking they're going to heaven, and not be upset with them? Figure that out. You're not walking in the footsteps of Jesus. The problem is that we get angry because I've been opposed. I've been slighted. Well, God gave me the ability to be angry just like he gave me the ability to be happy and gave me the ability to be sorrowful. But all three of them, anger, sorrow, and happiness, must be regulated and controlled by the word of God. And I'm the only one that can do it. There's something wrong with us. We won't get upset at brethren who will not do what God says, and they keep on and on and on violating God, but they want you to think they're the cat's meow of faithfulness. And you're not angry? You're not righteously indignant? Then I have to say there's something wrong with you, spiritually. I read in Romans 12, 9, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to the wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, 
I will repay, saith the Lord. You see, he's perfect in his knowledge of everything there is about you, motives, etc. If I wanted and had the right as a mere human being, if I had authority from God to punish somebody, I could never punish them knowing that they actually needed it and that was what they deserved, justice called for it. I couldn't do it like God does. I don't have the power to do it. I don't have the knowledge to do it. I can't know everything there is about somebody from the beginning to the end and know it flawlessly. We're dealing with the God who says concerning his knowledge, getting on our level of understanding it and the omniscience of God, even the very hairs of your head are numbered. And a sparrow doesn't even fall that he doesn't know about it. That ought to impress us. I don't know that it does, but a lot of things ought to that don't. It ought to enlighten us and teach us. Seeing it as a righteous thing with God, to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, Paul writes, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with the mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-9. Let me ask you something. What are the words and the meaning of them designed to do to the person that reads them in his understanding? Well, it was written to Christians to help them realize that all the wicked people who oppose you and persecute you and will not receive the gospel... They cannot escape. They will be punished forever when they die in their sins. And if you read the whole context of this, verses even preceding verse 6, well, this is 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 9, you'll see that God is saying it's the right thing for God to do this because He's flawless in justice. It's the right thing for His faithful children of God to say, we look forward to the day when those people who refuse the gospel and oppose the gospel and persecute the church will receive their just eternal reward. That should comfort the righteous who labor daily to do what's right. Christians have the God-given obligation to teach the truth without apology or compromise. I've already mentioned John 8, 31 and 32 and the commission to the church by Christ to preach the gospel to every creature. In Jude's statement to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. So many others it says we must stand for what's right and expose the error no matter what happens to us in so doing it. We must uphold evil. We must not only the concept or the philosophy that teaches it but those who do it. We are to do this and in so doing we are to clearly teach the narrow way that leads to heaven. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. We do not need to cause people to think that, well, you can just nonchalantly look toward heaven and say Christ, and you're going there. Jesus made that clear when he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. That was mean of him to say that, wasn't it? Did he know he was so loving and full of grace that he'd take care of all that and he'd overlook our sins and not expect us to repent of them and turn from them? Only through the gospel of Jesus Christ is salvation found. There's no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. We are to warn all sinners, such as those who, who run Target. And I understand they've actually had a change of thought this morning, if you didn't see it. They backed off of what they were declaring lately. We'll see how long that goes. Uh, it does say one thing. We're here to make money, and we're not going to let anything handicap that. And if you're unaware of what we're talking about, they've had decided to say that the motley crowd known as the transgenders would be able to use restrooms as everybody else. 
But they may change. It makes no difference what they do. We hope people like them will all change back to what it once was in moral concept. But whether they do or they don't, that doesn't change our obligation to be what we ought to be and to speak what we ought to speak and to do what we ought to do in our godly influence and our opposition to evil and our living in righteous lives. We must warn people of the coming judgment day to where every individual will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, 2 Corinthians 5.10. At that time, God will condemn the majority of all men who ever lived who were accountable to him because most will follow the easy way and few will have heard God's will and humbly all their life lived it. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. You think they have any concept of that? And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it, as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me. Somebody puts this up every once in a while on Facebook, the most scary words to ever hear, Depart from me. I never knew you. And that's true. Can you picture yourself standing there and Christ saying, Depart from me? Ye that work iniquity and the everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. And you know what you'll do? You'll depart from him and you'll go there. Every king and every queen and every parliament and every congress and all the people of the world who boasted of this world and loved this world, but who would not give ear to the truth and who arrayed themselves against it, they will depart at his command. There will be no choice. And so will we if we haven't been faithful. He tells them then in the rest of this how they didn't do what the righteous did. And they thought they did, but you must remember, you can do all sorts of things that are right and holy and helps other people, but if you're not one of those who's been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and your obedience to the gospel and faithful adherence to submitting to his authority set out only in the New Testament, it will not be counted. It does not count. It will not get you to heaven. You must be doing what God said do in the way God said do it. And for the reason or more than one reason he said do it. You must be fully obedient to his will. Or it doesn't count. You can stand there on the day of judgment and say all my life I believe you were the son of God. Well if he were to reply. He may ask well did you repent of your sins and confess your faith in me. Were you immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No but I believed in you. You know what you're going to hear? Depart from me. I never knew you. And for those of us in the church, well, we've done that, haven't we? How much of the New Testament is written to those in the church that have done that to keep them faithful? Most of it. Now, why? It's too easy to know it and do it, and then it comes right down to sticking with it all your life. You quit. Are you faithful like the New Testament says you're faithful? will receive, depart from me too, ye that work iniquity. When you do things and thought in your mind it's serving God, but it's not authorized by the Bible, it's iniquity. It's sin. All this is found in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. He shall answer unto them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not unto one of the least of these, ye did it not to me, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous into life eternal. In Matthew 13, 40 through 43, he also dealt with this. This deals more among those who think they're servants of God, but they're not, compared and contrasted to those who really are. That is Matthew 25, 31 through 46. But then listen to this. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, 
so shall it be at the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of the, his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. Now you see kingdom here, but let me remind you, Christ is over the whole world, but only those that believe the gospel and obey it are those that really submit to it. Kingdom here is not used to mean the Lord's church. It's meant the whole of the world where he has authority. And the Lord is going to separate the church out from those in the world. We must understand that. So I close by saying we must use every white way and means to expose sin, to rebuke the sinners, and to call them to obey the gospel. It's the only hope they have. We must not be afraid of government. We must not be afraid of corporations. We must not be afraid of news media. We must not be afraid of educational institutions or anyone anywhere when it comes to our discharging our Christian obligations to declare to all people at all times God's truth and the demands God makes on people if heaven would be their home. Our attitude and our conduct must be as stated by the peerless Apostle Paul when he wrote to Timothy these words. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Paul then says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. 2 Timothy 4, 2-8. through 8. The Apostle John reminds us that the whole world lies in wickedness. And we must face it for what it actually is. 1 John 5, 19. We must conduct ourselves all the time as Christians. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. We must carry the gospel. We must defend the gospel. We must live the gospel. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. And here's something we need to understand. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth and boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Ephesians 6, 11 through 19. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4, 12. It will be that word that will be opened as the standard of judgment on the day of judgment. And how shall it be with us then? I adjure the elders and the deacons and every member and all preachers everywhere. To make plans to fight the fight of faith in the world we live in. We don't live in 1900. We don't live even in 1960. We live in 2016 and we must face what is here today with the gospel that is certainly capable of overcoming anything the devil has to offer. If we will simply, by faith in his word, act accordingly. Now how are we standing? I close by saying, I wonder how much planning... 
was done to get ready for the Normandy invasion of World War II? Well, to ask the question is to say much planning over a long period of time. We are the army of the living God. How much planning do we do as a congregation, as individuals, to invade the kingdom of Satan and to effectively overthrow it with the word of truth? It has been said the United States was the arsenal of the world in World War II. Well, it could have stayed over here and had all the stuff wherewith it took to do whatever to overcome evil in World War II. But if it hadn't put it into practice on the basis of a sound plan, it wouldn't work. And so it is with the spiritual army of the Lord. Let me ask the elders, do you ever think of yourself as generals? you ever sit down as generals and you're planned out something to lead this church to charge up the hill? And to see that every person is in its proper order and trained to do it? Do, do the members, do they think that way? If you don't, we ought to. If we walk in the footsteps of he who loved us and gave his life for us. Whom the writer of Hebrews calls the captain of our salvation. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we've studied what it takes to become a Christian today. And you can't go to heaven without being a faithful Christian. Will you obey the gospel this day by being baptized in the Christ for the remission of your sins with the determination to be faithful to him in the Lord's church as long as you live? As a child of God, are you faithful? Are you meeting the demands of Christ today in this world? Or are you just kind of glad I'm finally through today and we can go back there and eat? Are you subject to the invitation? If you are, please come while we stand and sing.